like their rights. And perhaps because we like our rights more than we like our government, we time and again have put baby Ninth Amendments in our constitutions to protect those rights, even though we do not spell all those rights out. In order for those protections to have full effect, however, it falls to judges to enforce them. That's a quote from a forthcoming book called Baby Ninth Amendments, How Americans Embrace Unenumerated Rights and Why It Matters. I'm Josh Windham, attorney at the Institute for Justice and your host for today's episode. I'm joined by your usual host, Anthony Sanders, director of IJ's Center for Judicial Engagement and author of the book I just quoted, who's going to tell us all about Baby Ninth Amendments and why they matter. Anthony, congrats on the book and welcome to Short Circuit. Thank you, Josh. It's uh, it's nice to be on the other side of this microphone, and and you do make a lovely host. Well, thanks a bunch. Why don't you tell folks before we get started um, about where they can find the book? Yes. So uh, you may be listening to this before the book uh, comes out, or you may be listening to it uh, while it comes out or long after that, but it is scheduled to be released on May 9th. You can find it in the show notes uh, at a link we'll put there. You can also find it in most places you buy books online. Um, Search for Baby Ninth Amendments. It's published by University of Michigan Press, and it is uh, available for a decent price at a a paperback or hardback. But if you'd like the electronic version, it's actually going to be available for free. And there will be an an audio, uh, audio version as well. Um, I don't know if that will be ready at publication time, but it should be soon thereafter. Great. Um, well, some folks may have heard of the Ninth Amendment, hopefully, but maybe others have not heard of Baby Ninth Amendment. So why don't you just give us a brief introduction to what this book about, what this book is about, and why you wrote it? Yes. So first of all. Uh, let me define what we we are throwing around here, baby Ninth Amendments, and then I'll get into the background for what the book is about. So uh, you hopefully have heard of the Ninth Amendment if you are uh, an American listening who's into the, the Constitution. The Ninth Amendment is one of the original Bill of Rights adopted in 1791, shortly after the Constitution itself was adopted. And it says that the enumeration of rights in the Constitution um, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Supreme Court has never really done much with the uh, Ninth Amendment over the years, here and there, just a little tiny bit, but um, usually not in majority opinions. And um, what most people don't understand, though, and just don't know about, is that the, not, the language from the Ninth Amendment has been readopted in state constitutions over the years, and it's actually had more of a life in those state constitutions in their courts. Not a big life, but a bit of a life. And it's been adopted 33 times um, over the last couple centuries in various state constitutions. So my book is about what these provisions in state constitutions mean, what rights they protect, how they've been interpreted over the years, why they were placed in state constitutions, and then a little bit of the end of the book about what that then means for the U.S. Constitution itself, including the Ninth Amendment itself, but also more generally for this whole concept of unenumerated rights, rights that are not explicitly spelled out in a constitution, whether the federal or state constitutions, but that nevertheless are constitutionally protected. How do, how do they work? How, why would you have them in a constitution? And these baby ninths are kind of a way to understand how that might happen. Use the example um, in the book of a lady named Jane to demonstrate what unenumerated rights are and how they work. Uh, why don't you just give us a bit of a taste of um, that discussion? Yes, yeah. So um, open in the introduction, it's actually a device that was suggested to me by uh, our colleague Dana Berliner a few years ago. And I think it's a, a great way to think about why we would have unenumerated rights in the in the first place. So the introduction opens um, with uh, Jane, this American, and her day. So what does she do during the course of a day? Well, 
all the normal things. She gets up, she chooses what she eats, she maybe goes to work. If she has kids, she takes them to school, she goes and gardens. At some point, um, she maybe goes out with friends and plays a game. Maybe she plays basketball. Maybe she plays uh, poker. Maybe she does some work at home to fix up her house. And all of these mundane things, some pretty minor. I give an example of stamp collecting that I harp on for a, for a while. Um, and some really important, like where you work or what school you choose for your children. They're all choices that you make in your life that in just about all state constitutions and definitely the federal constitution, there's nothing that says explicitly that's a right that is protected. But all of us would say that these are important liberties, right? Your, your right to earn a living, as we always talk about at IJ, your right to garden. We had a case a few years ago where um, a, a Florida community said, you can't have a garden, a vegetable garden in your front yard that was actually enforced by that city. So um, these are all important liberties that Jane has, but they're not protected. So say a law comes along and says, you can't do that. Uh, you can't garden in your front yard. You can't work that occupation. Say it's uh, uh, hair braiding, as many people know us for our cases about hair braiding and licensing over the years. Uh, you can't work that occupation unless you have this nonsensical license. Or you can't do all kinds of other things. You can't rent out your basement to someone that you know because you live in a single family community. And so we're going to make it illegal for you to provide housing to someone. So pick whatever it is. If it's not something that's explicitly in the Federal Bill of Rights or your State Bill of Rights, well, it seems like at first you're out of luck. And a lot of people who say, you know, unenumerated rights are illegitimate, they're just made up by judges that out of whole cloth, would say, yeah, I guess you're out of luck. You, unless you have a political solution, you can't go to court to protect that liberty, even if, well, yeah, it does seem pretty important. So my point is, Jane looks in her state bill of rights, also her federal bill of rights, and sees this language. That's the Ninth Amendment, or is very similar to the Ninth Amendment, as the baby knights are. And that language seems to indicate to her that there are rights beyond just those listed. And so perhaps her right that she's worried about is going to be protected by the Constitution as well. So my book then tries to answer that question. Um, does this language in her state constitution protects these un protect these unenumerated rights? How does it do that? How do we um, interpret this language? How do we put it into action in court? And then what is the kind of the broader takeaway from that too? So in, in trying to figure out, does this language protect unenumerated rights and how, uh, you have a pretty lengthy discussion of the different historical uh, iterations of baby Ninth Amendments when they were adopted and what the delegates might have been saying about them when they were being adopted or at least proposed. So tell us about that. Was there any debate among delegates in these states over their adoption? What were the major arguments at the time? Uh, give us a sketch of that. Yeah. So this, for some people, might be the, the fun part of the book, the, the history, where these provisions come from, what people have said about them over the years. This is like the, the nitty gritty of digging into um, uh, transcripts from constitutional conventions in the 1840s is one thing I did to, to put this book together. Um, some people will be more into the later stuff, the more the philosophy and the, um, the, the jurisprudence. Um, but the, the history side, I have to say, was a, a lot of fun to put together. Most of it is in, has been in a couple previous law review articles that are now um, put into the book. But there's some, there's some new stuff in there, too. Um, they, so the fun, the fun thing to think about in thinking about unenumerated rights and state constitutions is you get this whole historical sweep of America. Uh, and you don't really get that when you just think about the U.S. Constitution. Um, and I think this is something maybe for people to take away from the book who maybe are ambivalent or, or aren't struck by the, the whole concept of unenumerated rights. Just to, what you learn about constitutionalism and American constitutionalism 
from studying the history of state constitutions, not just, you know, 1787 and then Reconstruction, as, as most people think about American constitutionalism. So if you think about the, the founding of the nation and when state constitutions started to be written, which was as early as early 1776, uh, Americans were kind of building the plane while fly, flying it, um, for lack of a better metaphor. They, uh, you know, the the English, British uh, historical background didn't have written constitutions, but Americans started writing them. So a way, so they had a way to organize their governments and then also protect against these governments because they didn't want them to be tyrannical, like they saw uh, King George and Parliament were tyrannical. And so they they write provisions in there um, to protect. Uh, to protect rights and bills of rights, along with the other things you have in constitutions uh, to, to protect against tyranny, like separation of powers. And along the way, they started writing provisions that were kind of broad. So there were pre- pre- plenty of things like freedom of the press, um, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. You know, those are, are two real standards that are in most state constitutions, if, if not all state constitutions. And then they... They'd have you know broad statements like the, protect the pursuit of happiness. Uh, that sounds pretty broad, right? Most of Jane's uh, rights, I think, would be protected by that. Um, and then the Ninth Amendment comes along, which is a whole discussion in itself about what that means. That I, I try to leave aside in the book, frankly, because I I, I want to send kind of an olive olive branch to people who disagree, say, with most libertarians on what the Ninth Amendment e- means and say, OK, you can believe that about the U.S. Constitution. But when it comes to state constitutions, I think we can agree that it's more protective than you think the Ninth Amendment is of individual rights. But anyway, we get to a point and that's in um, 1819. So that's 30 years after the Ninth Amendment was was fully drafted in Congress. And two states, Alabama and Maine, are setting up their new states. So they're steady, setting up their constitutions for the first time. And they put language in there that's, they're both a little bit different, but it's basically the Ninth Amendment. And like, why are they doing that? Uh, there's been constitutions between the Ninth Amendment and these states that didn't have Ninth Amendment language, baby Ninth language, but they do. And then over the course of decades after that, states slowly start putting this language more and more into their constitutions. Not all states, but more. And so you get to the Civil War and you have there's a dozen states that have done this. After the Civil War and Reconstruction, there's more. Again, not all, but more. And the further you get in the U.S. history, the more and more states put Ninth Amendment language into their constitutions. And the, the latest, actually, uh, is Illinois, which it's... Um, current constitution was adopted in 1970 and that constitution adopted baby ninth amendment language ninth amendment language so over the course of u.s history you go from zero to 33 zero percent to 66 percent uh have this kind of language now what did they your original question josh was what did they say along the way um it's interesting studying constitutional conventions uh, because as a lot of listeners may know the 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 u.s constitutional convention the the famous one in 1787 we don't have a transcript of what they said we do have madison's notes which were published years later and there's a, a few other you know sources here and there about what was discussed um that's also often true of state constitutional conventions. So especially some of the early ones, we just don't know what was said. We have a journal, you know, there was a motion to add this language. It was voted on. Often we don't even know what the vote was. And then we know what was spat, spat out at the end of, of, of the process. Um, but some we do have uh, transcripts um, over, the, over the years. Uh, it was more common, although uh, unfortunately for historians, not as common as you'd like for conventions to um, to write down what everyone said, or at least have some kind of committee report, that kind of thing. And by and large, when these provisions have been talked about in state constitutional conventions, people have just assumed that 
these rights are protected. So unenumerated rights are protected. In fact, most of the debate where there has been debate is between people who say, well, let's have this Ninth Amendment language in there so we can also have, you know, not have other rights left out. Um, and sometimes they go as far as to say they're protected. And then there are people who say, why do we even need that? Everyone knows these rights are also our rights. Just because we don't list it in the Constitution doesn't mean it's a right, with the implication being that uh, you, those are still rights that are retained by the people that are protected. Um, now, they usually don't get too down the rabbit hole of, you know, what all that that means, as, a, as a, a judge might say. But it was just kind of assumed that rights of a certain kind, I think that they're usually meaning natural rights or rights that have long been understood to be protected in our culture, um, that they are protected from what the state might do to you in the future, that's a pretty profound difference than kind of the more positivist view you might have today, where a lot of people like Justice Scalia was a perfect example of this, would say, okay, if it's spelled out in the Constitution that the right is protected, like free speech, yes, that right is protected. But if it's, um, if it's not in there, then it might be a right that you have in a certain philosophical sense, but it's not a right that binds the government in some way. That has to be a right of positive law. Uh, they just didn't think that way in the, it seems, in the 19th century when they were when they were talking about this. And indeed, even through the 20th century, um, this was not that controversial of the thing, which is to just say, okay, and then we have other rights out there. I say in the book often that these are kind of et cetera clauses. So you list a bunch of rights and then you say, et cetera, et cetera. Now, thankfully, they, they say a bit more than that um, as to figure out what these rights are, but um, they were okay with that idea. And I think that shows that, you know, uh, when we interpret our constitutions, whether or federal or state, you can't interpret them with whatever the latest, you know, fad in modern philosophy is, whether it's positivism or, or something else, you kind of have to meet them on their own terms and their own terms are, yeah, we, we have a bunch of Americans got together. We tried to figure out what we wanted to say. We meant what we said. And um, we meant them the, the Constitution to protect liberty, which is, at the end of the day, what these kinds of clauses are supposed to do. You know, a lot of provisions in the Constitution, in any Constitution, might seem like they make sense or are understandable or are easily enforceable when you first read them. But then you realize it takes some interpretation to figure out what would fall under the scope of those provisions. So, I mean, that that may have been partially what was motivating Justice Scalia regarding the Ninth Amendment, right? Which is how do we objectively figure out what rights would be protected as judges under the Ninth Amendment? And how do we do that in an objective way uh, without delving into judicial policymaking or stepping on a judicial activism landmine, right? So... What, in your view, is the you know, most uh, objective or historically founded way to go about reading Baby Ninth Amendment so that you can figure out which rights fall under them and which rights don't? Yeah. Uh, so great question. And essentially, uh, so this is going to sound a little flippant, but essentially, yeah, we read them, we take them seriously. And then we try to put them into action. Now, Justice Scalia, he, he was actually more extreme, I think, than most people have been on the Supreme Court about not enforcing the Ninth Amendment. But he did say in a case, in a dissent, that um, the Ninth Amendment you know, it's, articulates certain rights, but I, as a judge, don't have the power to enforce them. Well, the Ninth Amendment and the baby Ninth Amendments don't say that. They just they say what they say, and they say what they say, just like the other provisions of the Bill of Rights. So I think at a minimum, we have to say, uh, look, whatever your state Bill of Rights is, you, we, we now all understand that they are judicially enforceable. I mean, they're enforceable against, they're, they bind all governmental actors. They bind the legislature, they bind the governor, they bind your local cop, your local mayor, and they also... I uh, have to be taken seriously by judges and judges can enforce them. But 
then you still have to get to the question, okay, well, what does it really mean? Now, I quoted the Ninth Amendment itself earlier, just about all, a few little exceptions, just about all um, baby ninths are written essentially the same way. A lot use the word impair instead of uh, deny or disparage or in addition to. Um, I think maybe because impair is kind of a stronger verb that uh, you, you are not to um, impair these other rights retained by the people just because some rights are uh, enumerated. Now, um, we, don't, we don't have to go fully down the, the discussion in our limited time today, Josh, about um, wh what, how you parse the, ninth, the language of the Ninth Amendment, the language of uh, baby Ninth Amendments, um, because that can get a little technical. But kind of the, the top line view that I give is you're right when you really get into the language of, of constitutional law and how to operationalize it, you have a kind of another level. Uh, you know, some people call this the construction zone uh, of how you operationalize the meaning of the language into how it, how it actually comes to life in court. And um, this is where we get things, you know, such as scrutiny, right? So our listeners on Short Circuit know all about talking about um, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, rational basis scrutiny. Um, some, I know some uh, constitutional lawyers and, and professors think that that uh, is just a, a framework we should junk and instead just to kind of like, is it right infringed or is it isn't infringed? I'm actually okay with scrutiny. I think judges eventually are going to do something like that. So it's something useful to be to be used, but um, to cut through a long uh, argument, I think that these baby ninths um, they all use this word retained. So really, what the 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 baby ninths come down to when you're trying to operationalize them is um, what does retained mean? And then separately, when it says deny or disparage, you, you, not to deny or disparage others retained by the people, um, what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the other rights that are listed? Uh, and so there's two things to take away then. One, on the other rights that are listed, however you're enforcing the other rights, so the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion that's, uh, that's otherwise enumerated in your Bill of Rights – that you need to enforce whatever these other rights are at the same way. So you give them strict scrutiny, you have to give the other rights strict scrutiny. You give them intermediate scrutiny, you have to give the other rights intermediate scrutiny. I think that is a way that we operationalize. Like, I'm not going to say whether this is construction or meaning. I know some like original scholars get really into it, that. I just mean you have the text on the page and then you operationalize it when you're in court. And I think that's a way to do that. So, but then that still leaves the big question of what retained means. Um, and I, I think retained, usually when people have looked at this, um, I, and I think the majority consensus is, is right, um, that, uh, at least on this particular question, that retained is a term of uh, the social contract. So your listeners uh, probably have heard about um, the, the social contract theory. So this is, you know, something that John Locke, the English philosopher um, of the 17th century, uh, talked about a lot and other people believed in, um, believed in as a, a method of thinking through, right, human society, not necessarily as a historical reality. I definitely don't think the social contract is a, at least as it's fleshed out by these philosophers, is a historical reality. But it is a way to think about how we organize a society and definitely how we organize a constitution, which is the highest law in that little society. And, um, and so retained is invoking this idea of a social contract where people come together and they give up their, some of their rights they had in the, quote, state of nature. And in return, they get benefits, which is essentially the protection of uh, the government and the things we do together, uh, as some politicians like to say, as a government. 
but they retain rights. So the the main I um takeaway I try to emphasize when I when I talk about this and write about this and in various contexts is that um our constitutions, both the US Constitution and our various state constitutions, um, assume Locke, not Hobbes. So they're not all like all these delegates weren't sitting around reading John Locke's second treatise of government and saying, okay, we're gonna make this the constitution. That, that that's not what I mean. It's in the in the back of their minds and their their philosophical um kind of framework, they think of a Lockean sense, they don't think of a Hobbesian sense. So Hobbes famously um, is the, the the guy who comes up with the idea of Leviathan? So, um, like that the, that that term originally from the Bible is now when people hear Leviathan, right? They think like an absolute dictator because that's what Hobbes talked about. We all come together. Um, we want to escape this terrible state of nature, and so we give up all our power to the Leviathan, who then is going to take care of us, and then we got to obey that guy. I mean, Hobbes says he'll be benevolent, you know, so not, not a big deal, right? <laughs> of course, there's nothing to worry about there. Well, like no state constitutional convention ever says, hey, let's go, let's go with Hobbes, right? They don't mention Locke very much at all either, but they, in what they want to set up, they want to give up some of their rights to this state government. Yes, but we're going to retain a whole bunch. Um, and often you get even more than just baby ninth amendments, you get all kinds of other language in state constitutions that, you know, is like, we're, we're only giving up as much as we need to here. So, um, that's the framework that you, that is in the background when you see this word retained. So retained by the people, there are rights that we retain. Um, they are state of nature type rights, um, so I do not mean, and I, I, I take pains to spell this out in the book, I do not mean that our state constitutions, when they have a baby Ninth Amendment, just encapsulate Lockean state of nature theory. Like, and that is our law. I do not mean that. But the general idea that you have, you have a state of liberty in the state of nature, and then you give up some of that liberty, but you keep what you came in, some of what you came in with, quite a bit of what you came in with, um, is the way to think about it. So what does that mean? Um, it means that rights like Jane has, right to garden, uh, right to choose a school for your child and as a voluntary contract with someone else, right to earn a living, um, right to rent your basement out to um, someone to earn a little extra money, um, right to collect stamps, those are all Lockean liberties, right? That you could have in the state of nature and then you retain them when you come into society. It doesn't mean other kinds of rights such as positive rights. So a right to be like provided an education or a right to healthcare be provided for you or, or something like that. It also doesn't mean um, certain, and I, I equivocate a little bit in this in the book and I'd be curious of what people think of my argument, but it doesn't really mean um, other procedural rights, like say your um, right to confront a witness in court. Um, that is a very important right. It's a right that's actually spelled out in many constitutions. It's a right that I think is implicit in the concept of due process, which is a, you know, a separate provision in in most constitutions or the, the equivalent law of the land clauses as a lot of state constitutions have, but your retained rights, it's not those rights. Um, and so those are the rights that are protected by these baby ninth amendments. Now, how do they, how does that come up? So you say you go into court and you say, well, I have the, this is a retained right. It's not otherwise spelled out in the bill of rights, but um, it is a, you know, a Liberty right. Um, say it's your your right to garden in your front yard, and you say this is being infringed by the government, and so I want an injunction to stop my city from preventing me from doing that. Okay, so that is an invocation of that right, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win. Just like in any lawsuit invol involving rights, then the government can come in and say, oh, you know, we have this evidence that shows that. Um, this is a really needed ordinance, and so we have to enforce it to protect public health and safety or or whatever it is. Um, there's a lot you could argue about there. There's a lot of 
uh, facts you could come up with, but essentially it has to be some real level of protection. It can't be the federal rational basis test, for example, because we all know that then leads to essentially no protection. Doesn't necessarily have to be strict scrutiny. And maybe some libertarians are going to be angry with me for you know not mandating strict scrutiny for every single one of these rights um, in, a, in a baby ninth amendment. Uh, I could live with a world where it's not strict scrutiny, but it's actually real scrutiny and protect, really protects people. And we expect judges are going to enforce this. But that's what it means. Uh, so very long answer to your question, Josh. It means these state of nature rights with some kind of real protection at the same level as uh, other rights that are actually spelled out in your constitution. Now, one thing I didn't quite get, and that maybe you can help me understand, is whether you think that different states, citizens, retain different rights, or whether, because we're talking about the same kind of state of nature theory, um, retained rights are basically the same for Americans, regardless of which state they happen to live in. Uh, what's your view on that? Yeah. Uh, so I think that basic, the, the short answer is those right for baby ninth amendments with a couple possible exceptions because they're worded differently, those rights are going to be the same. Um, but I want to emphasize a lot of this comes down to how the Constitution is written. And here, I'm, you know, the, the viewpoint, and I'm open to criticism, the viewpoint I put forward in the book is uh, maybe much more kind of based on textualism than other people, including other libertarians, might um, might view con the you know, how to interpret our, our state and federal constitutions. So you could, like, you could have a provision, going back a little bit to what I said before, but in answer to your question, you could have a provision that protects unenumerated positive rights. I think it would be a terrible idea, by the way. And I think it would, like, it would be hard for judges to enforce because enforcing positive rights, we've learned through various examples, even if you like, really like positive rights, it is hard for judges to enforce that for kind of more obvious practical reasons. Um, you know, that they don't have the sword of the purse, uh, for example. Um, but uh, you could word a constitution that way. It's just, they're not worded that way. Right. So then we look at how baby ninth amendments are worded. They all use this word retained. And there's no reason to think, and I, I go into this a bit in the book because I, I write the book from um, an originalist background. I don't think at all you need to be an originalist to in interpret baby ninth amendments the same way I do. But I kind of, I, I come from this background. I try to be open about it. Like I, I believe in the fixation thesis, which is kind of the, the bedrock of what all originalists believe that the meaning of a text doesn't change over time. Um, and, and so I say, okay, what does retain mean? What did it mean in 1819 or 1820 when the, the main constitution was adopted? That's actually the oldest continuous baby ninth. Alabama's had a number of constitutions over the years, but Maine's just had the one, um, to Illinois in 1970 or indeed Rhode Island, which readopted a baby ninth, the new constitution in 1986, right? Does it does the meaning change over time? So those rights are, are different. So the meaning's not going to change because um, the the Constitution is adopted at a time where people believe in rights maybe a little differently, which of course they do in 1970 to 1820. It's whether the the language has a different meaning at that time. And what I what I show is. As, as people could probably guess, the word retained, especially in a rights context, it, it's ever since the founding of the country, it's basically had this Lockean meaning. Um, you could protect rights with different language, but you don't. And so that means that in these various provisions, um, it's going to be the rights that kind of you would have in a state of nature. Um, again, not something that actually exists or has existed, but it's the way to think about how those rights are protected, that that is what these um, baby nights protect. And, and Josh, you're probably thinking of, I have this long um, 
a passage in chapter six of my book where I kind of go go down a thought experiment about like, are there, uh, it, does it protect just rights you happen to have at any one time? Like even rights in statutory law, are they protected by your constitution? And I, I think I show, although you might think that once you really dig down into the meaning, it just can't mean that. Otherwise you get some absurd results. Um, and, uh, and so at the end of the day, yeah, I think it, it, it is the same at different time periods in, in U.S. history because they're all, you, all using this kind of same just philosophical framework. What about states that don't have a baby Ninth Amendment? So about a third of U.S. states don't have one of these. Um, I've litigated in one of them, Pennsylvania, um, multiple times, actually. Um, I, I wonder what you think about whether unenumerated rights are protected in these states or whether maybe a different provision in their constitutions sort of can do the same lifting as a baby ninth. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so, yes, um, they can. Uh, Pennsylvania, especially because as Josh knows more than just about anyone, it has this wonderful um, opening provision to its Bill of Rights that talks about uh, the, the very broad rights, like I was talking about earlier, the right to liberty. I can't do it off the top of my head, but pursue happiness, uh, acquire, protect, and defend property, I think is, a, is another one. So um, that is a, that's a different kind of, of clause uh, that Stephen uh, Calabresi, our, our friend at IJ, has, has written about in some, some wonderful uh, work that he's done. Um, he calls them Lockean natural rights guarantees. Sounds kind of familiar, right? Uh, Lockean rights uh, to to what's going on in baby nights, and I see those as um, depending on how they're worded, they're they're kind of getting at the same thing as baby nights are, which is broadly protecting rights. So you could call those like, for example, those those are the most immediate ex example that answers your question, especially in Pennsylvania. Is they they're broad language that could refer to all kinds of human activity, all kinds of Lockean human activity. Um, and so a lot of states have both, like they'll have a, a Lockean natural rights guarantee of this flowing language that originally drafted by George Mason in, in 1776. Uh, and then at the end, they'll have a baby ninth. And you, you know, some, you might even say, well, why do you have both? And the answer is because delegates uh, who draft constitutions um, are okay with redundancy. So this, you know, the rule against surplusage is something we've talked about on short circuit before about how you, you know, if you have, uh, you can't have language that uh, doesn't do anything just because there's other language in the constitution. And so it has to have its own meaning. Well, I mean, those two, that, that, that's true to a point, but there's, there's times where the rule against surplusage, um, shouldn't come into play and other other methods of interpreting text come into play. I think especially of constitutions, um, you couldn't have delegates who are writing a constitution who are really concerned about, say, a certain kind of future abuse of the government. Or maybe they're concerned about the government, making sure the government um, does something for the people, maybe even a positive right in a certain way. And so they, you know, you tell it, like, like they say when you're writing an essay, you tell them, you tell them what you told them, and you tell them again. And so you might have the same right protected three different times in a constitution um, because they were very concerned about that. But I don't, I don't think that that means um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that we should read them as not doing anything. So you have some con state constitutions that have that kind of broad language um, and not a baby ninth amendment. And I don't think we should think, well, they knew about baby ninth amendments and they didn't include that. So they didn't believe in unenumerated rights. I don't think you can con should conclude that at all. Now, there are some states without either of those. Um, and um, they may have, say, a due process clause. Uh, and due process clauses, I know this is more controversial, which is actually part of the reason I wrote the book, um, is whether they, whether the, the concept of due process protects, due process of law or due course of law protects unenumerated rights. And I think the evidence for that is that they generally do. Um, and so for if you're in court in a state that just has a due process or due course of law clause, depending on um, the history and what it says, uh, 
you're, you're going to have to dig into that. But, um, you know, as a, as a facial matter, yeah, I think they should be interpreted to protect um, enumerate, uh, unenumerated rights. However, I would say to those critics out there of substantive due process who um, usually, you know, people who are big critics of substantive due process, they're also big critics of unenumerated rights. And they kind of see them as the same thing. In fact, a great disservice that has been done um, in, by of all people, Westlaw and Lexis, is if you if you look at cases about unenumerated rights and you get down to like the head note, it'll say substantive due process. And then I'll have the little quote from the case that, you know, if you click on the little button, it'll take you down to where it is. And the non-lawyers have no idea what I'm talking about, but any lawyer knows, oh yeah, that's how Lexis and, and, and Westlaw work. Um, it takes you down to the case where it talks about often those cases don't even mention due process, but it says substantive due process. Why? Because substantive due process has become a code word for unenumerated rights. Whereas the way unenumerated rights are designed to be protected in most state constitutions, and I would also say the U.S. Constitution, has nothing to do with due process clauses. And yet we always call it substantive due process. So if you think substantive due process is a dumb idea because, I mean, I don't, but if you think it's a dumb idea because it's you know contradictory and, and meaningless, well, come over to me and see these Baby Knights Amendments or maybe these other provisions that, that are written differently. And hey, what about these? Do they protect unenumerated rights? And if you're just off, off the top of your head without looking into the you know what I've talked about, what, what people like Stephen Calabresi have talked about and say, oh no, no, those don't protect unenumerated rights either. Then really you're just reflectively disagreeing with the idea of unenumerated rights, not with how these constitutions were actually put together and you're you're not open to the idea, which is not at all nuts, that maybe someone would write a constitution to protect unenumerated rights. And they'd actually have language in there that essentially says, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's one kind of bottom line at the end of the book uh, that I that I try to emphasize is it is not crazy to think that someone would write a constitution, maybe you disagree. Maybe you're like, if I was at that convention, I would object vociferously and think that is a dumb idea. Well, you weren't there and the other people were, and they wrote it this way. And it's not crazy to think, well, they actually were trying to protect unenumerated rights. So what do you do as a state judge when you're interpreting this provision? Um, well, you should do what the constitution says not if the you know if you a state judge actually as a policy matter think unenumerated rights is oh my gosh what what are we going to get into if we actually do that that's not what the delegates put together you're supposed to interpret what the constitution says right i hear this over and over again from con conservatives we're supposed to do what the constitution says well if the constitution says protect unenumerated rights that's what the judges are supposed to do um and so i i i ask people who read the book to be open-minded, even if you don't like unenumerated rights as an idea and you think due process is a, is a, is substantive due process is an oxymoron. Um, that doesn't mean unenumerated rights can't be interpreted in a different way. All that being said, I do think for si different reasons that this book isn't about at all, um, that due process clauses, Due process of law clauses can be a way to protect unenumerated rights. And indeed, when people were putting together state constitutions, especially after the founding era, and they knew that courts were protecting unenumerated rights through due process clauses, which is a history that goes back a long way, it's not crazy at all to think, well, they put that in there and, and you know, that that meaning at that time was that it would protected unenumerated rights. But then there are other people who put together state constitutions who wanted to maybe tell you what they meant, tell you what they told them, and tell you again. Well, I want to wrap up with one final question for you. Um, obviously, you think it's important that folks start to take Baby Ninth Amendment seriously, including state judges. How do you think we go from a place where that hasn't really happened historically to where you'd like to see us go? Yeah, um, there's an, an easy answer and a hard answer. Um, the easy answer is... Judges should start, one, being more open to unenumerated rights. And we're, we're this period, you know, after the the Dobbs 
decision where it seems like unenumerated rights are on the retreat, which unfortunately, as always happens in the modern day and age with unenumerated rights, everyone's minds head to the abortion question, whereas there's a heck of a lot of other things to talk about when it comes to unenumerated rights. Um, but what should happen is when these provisions come up uh, in uh, in various states, when they're litigated, judges should enforce them the way that I argue they should be enforced, that they should have some kind of real scrutiny and that they actually do protect rights and not just suggest uh, protections of rights um, beyond just those enumerated. Now, that's easier said than done for a couple reasons. Um, one is there's not a lot of case law out there about these provisions. Funnily enough, the little that there is out there, judges do generally recognize that these, unlike, you know, maybe what Justice Scalia says about the Ninth Amendment itself, um, that they protect unenumerated rights so that they get that. But then what you always get, and I think this is just part of the reflexiveness of the judicial restraint that we always criticize here at the Center for Judicial Engagement, is that they'll they'll have a, a large degree of deference. So they'll essentially have rational basis for these rights. Where, whereas the text, if it means anything else, the text of the baby ninth should put them on the same footing as enumerated rights. Um, but judges generally have, haven't done that. You do, there is, are some cases in the case law, and I talk about these in the book, and I actually expand on these a bit more um, recently on the Center for Judicial Engagement blog. So if people are interested in hearing more of, say, the stories of Baby Nights um, that I didn't you know, fill the book with to, to, to pad the pages, you can go read about them in, um, on the blog about how different people have, you know, they had a problem, they had this background, they were helped out because a judge found that their right was protected by, um, uh, by a Baby Ninth Amendment. So um, there are some examples of that. Uh, but generally what's happened, it's funny, generally what's happened with these baby Ninth Amendments over the years is they're just forgotten about both by judges, but also more importantly by lawyers. So a judge is, if he's doing his job right, is only going to rule on a case on the arguments that are presented. And um, that is up to the lawyers. And um, as we have bemoaned in various ways uh, over the years here in Short Circuit, especially when it comes to state constitutions, um, lawyers sometimes aren't the most creative. And I think some of this is whatever the case law is. So it kind of, the problem builds upon itself that, well, there aren't cases about baby nine, so we'll, we'll do this. Um, usually, just like an, in the story in um, federal court and the U.S. Constitution, when unenumerated rights are protected in state court under state constitutions. Generally, it's a case about a due process clause or um, the equivalent. Uh, and so the idea of substantive due process as the, you know, the, the way you protect unenumerated rights is just kind of there in the case law. And again, I think that part, partly it's the judges, but it's also it's the lawyers. So going forward, what should happen is we should have these, um, innovative, young, um, rock star litigators like Josh Windham going in the court where uh, there's a baby Ninth Amendment in that state and using that as a, as a claim and explaining, I mean, they can, they can cite to my book, they don't need to, that, look, this protects rights beyond just those enumerated. Um, I realize that uh, with the case law being what it may, that that's not maybe a, an argument that's going to win you in trial court all the time, although it has over the years in the, the cases that I talked about. Um, but I think that especially as we're at a time when, you know, the, the kind of textualist revolution has been around for, for a, a few decades now of taking text seriously, um, originalism too, but I think it's more just a textualism thing that if, if you, if you, Bring up the text of the state constitution and look, this has to mean something. It means there's rights beyond just those in the constitution. It's a much kind of more uh, comfortable way of doing it than talking about substantive due process. I mean, especially, you know, politically even in 2023, that that should be the way that we, um, we protect unenumerated rights. 
And that in doing that, we're going to protect more rights than just those, you know, handful of unenumerated rights that in the modern era have been protected. So that means economic liberty gets a fair shake, property rights gets a fair shake, other kinds of personal liberties that have been rejected get a fair shake. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we'll all not only have more rights protected um, in a way that still allows, you know, for this common good of the government to do its thing in a, in a way that doesn't violate our rights. Um, for those, you know, worried out there about how I'm trying to uh, trying to bring down state governments with baby Ninth Amendments, that's not what I'm doing. But constitutions strike a balance between rights and government. This is a way to re-inject that that balance into our constitutional law, um, and do it in a way that is um, is true to what quote the people actually adopted in their constitution. So in that way, I think there's a message for both conservatives who are maybe suspicious of unenumerated rights and also for progressives who are maybe suspicious about certain kinds of unenumerated rights like economic liberty. This is a, a way, hopefully we can kind of have a, a bit of a compromise there and protect rights um, and in, a, in a way that, uh, that you know, has a uh, balance of everyone knowing that the government in the future could do some bad things. So let's have, uh, let's, let's going forward, have an agreement that we're going to err on the side of liberty, even though we're still going to allow this state government we've come together to create to do certain things. As Oprah would say, you get a right and you get a right and you get a right. <laughs> Well, thanks, Anthony, for coming on today and for bringing attention to these uh, important state constitutional provisions. I hope that everybody will take some time to read the book, uh, learn more about Baby Ninth Amendments, and most importantly, get engaged. Mm -hmm.